Hello, today we'll be taking apart the inverter of a Prius. This is the inverter we'll be taking apart today. I'm sure most of y'all know, but the Prius is a hybrid car manufactured by Toyota. A hybrid car uses both the engine and motors to drive. The Prius is a very popular hybrid vehicle and four generations have been manufactured so far. The inverter we'll be taking apart comes from the third generation Prius, also called the 30 model Prius. Now let's get a closer look at this inverter. Let's start from the outside. Each of these three holes on the front holds an electric terminal that can be connected to cables. The first is for the battery, the second is for the generator, and the third is for the motor. Electricity is converted within this box. For example, to rotate the motors, it receives electricity from this battery through the inverter and successfully rotates the motors. It also receives electricity generated from the power generator and charges the battery with that electricity or uses the power generated to run the motors. These are the kinds of things it does. Here, you can see the cap. There's one over here and another one on this side. The cap can be taken off and underneath is a hole for cooling water. The cooling water enters from one of the holes and exits through the other. One cool, trivial fact, the Prius has two cooling systems. The first is used to cool the engine, and the other is used to cool the inverter right here. The Prius holds two cooling systems because the inverter it holds is liable to heat. Inside the inverter, there are multiple semiconductors. Semiconductors are highly susceptible to heat and need to be maintained under 105 Celsius. What happens if we reuse the same cooling water from the engine? The cooling water from an engine can exceed 100 Celsius at times. If we reuse the same cooling water, the semiconductors may go bad. And this is why the Prius has its own cooling water unique to the inverter of the car. The Prius also has two radiators, one for the engine and the other for the inverter. Now let's get to disassembling. A lot of bolts are fastened to the outside, but we'll be taking those off as well. I was wondering why I was struggling to unfasten some parts, but then I realized there were some bolts hidden underneath this cover that were stopping me from unfastening the outside. Because I struggled too much, some of the components on the inside got damaged. But I was able to take the cover off. Now the cover is completely off. The cover was originally placed on top like this. And this is what it looks like underneath without the cover. There's a black box attached to the cover. This is the capacitor. Because I forced the cover off, part of the capacitor was damaged. But there should be no problem. Now the capacitor is off as well. This is the capacitor. It's pretty big, isn't it? I think it's a film capacitor manufactured by Panasonic. It says made in Japan. Yep, and it's a film capacitor. It also has the electrostatic capacity written. There are actually three film capacitors inside. The first is direct with 750 volts and 880 microfarads. The second is also direct with 470 volts and 315 microfarads. The third is 860 volts with 0.562 microfarads. The second film capacitor is most likely to smooth the battery voltage. The first and third film capacitors are for smoothing and filtering the voltage boosted by the DC-DC converter. There's this white object attached to the capacitor, but this is resistance. 
The resistance is 136 kilo ohms. It works to halt any discharge from the capacitor. Here we have the electronic board, and if we look underneath the board, we can see the various semiconductors. On the electronic board, we see the letters Toyota written in bold. The IC right next to it also has the letters Toyota. On the board are multiple ICs. There are one, two, three ICs just on this electronic board. One of the ICs is manufactured by NEC. The other IC has the letter D, which most likely stands for Denso. Other than the primary ICs, there are other electronic components. This one is manufactured by Toshiba. It has the Toshiba logo. We notice by looking at the electronic components that a lot of Japanese manufactured pieces are being used. Let's take a look at the back as well. This is what the back looks like. You can see all of these wires coiled up. These are all inductors. The Prius's battery voltage is 200 volts. Instead of using the voltage as it is, the power passes through a DC-DC converter, which increases it to 650 volts. These inductors are used as a part of this circuit. Right next to the inductor is a black cubicle box. This is a film capacitor. This is also manufactured by Panasonic. It says made in Japan. Both are manufactured by Panasonic. The first is direct with 900 volts and 0.8 microfarads. The second is also direct with 950 volts and 0.562 microfarads. These are definitely filtering capacitors. You can see how much space the inductor takes. It takes up around one third of the space. An inductor is heavy and costly, so ideally you want to make it as small as possible. There's another circuit on the back. The circuit is most likely to reduce voltage from the battery at around 200 volts to around 12 volts for most home electric appliances. There's an inductor right here and some small control circuits as well. The circuit boards and each of the white components can be taken off, so let's take a look inside. After unfastening all of the bolts, the components can be taken off like this. The circuit boards should be detachable, so let me take this off as well. There's a semiconductor module underneath connected to the electrical board, making it difficult to take the board off, so I'm going to cut the fixed portion. Can y'all see? This is the heart of the Prius's inverter. The semiconductors are laid out like this. This is the IGBT module. You might be able to see these silver objects, which are IGBTs. Let me zoom in closer. I've zoomed in to each individual IGBT. There's jelly on the surface which acts as an encapsulant and increases insulation and heat dissipation. It also stops rubbish from getting on the surface. The thick wire here is where the primary electric circuit runs. When running the motor or generating electricity, an electric current flows through this wire. There are a lot of IGBTs in this module, but each of these IGBTs has a different job. These four here are used to increase the voltage from 200 volts to 650 volts and are connected to the DC-DC converter. Four are used in pairs as a parallel circuit. DC-DC converters only require two IGBTs to function, but there are four used here. These two are used as parallel circuits, and the same can be said for these. I think that's what's going on. These six IGBTs are the ones that are connected to the generator. The terminal we detached usually fits right here. The electricity from the generator flows through and is rectified right here. On the right are another 12 IGBTs. These are also used parallelly so we can look at them as six IGBTs. An inverter is necessary to run a motor. 
and these IGBTs are necessary for the inverter. The terminal goes here and generates three-phase AC voltage for the motor. These IGBTs are necessary for this process. Unlike the generator IGBTs, there are pairs of parallel circuits. Running a motor requires a lot of electricity, so these parallel circuits are necessary to withstand the high electric current. The generator portion only has a single parallel circuit because it doesn't require as much current. The IGBTs run the motors, increase current from the battery, and charge electricity from the generator. When these occur, the IGBTs generate heat. The entire module emits heat and water is passed through to cool the module. There's a water jacket right underneath to effectively release any heat held by the IGBTs. Let's try removing the module to see how the cooling mechanism inside works. The module can be removed like this, and here is the IGBT module and the water jacket component. The heat exchanger was fastened pretty firmly and couldn't be removed. On the back of the module is a lot of grease. This area, with the inductor and other components, requires frequent cooling. The cooling water passes through this area not only to cool the IGBT module, but to also cool the other components in this area. There is grease used for heat dissipation on this side of the inverter as well. Let's take apart the side with the inductor to take a closer look at each of the components. I was able to take off a current transformer. Can y'all see? The core is attached with some tape, so let's cut the tape and look inside. Yep, it's a current transformer. The inside is like this. There's some grease over here as well. The grease is for effective cooling using the cooling water. This is a 12-volt secondary coil. This, on the other hand, is the primary coil, probably 200 volts. This is the core of the current transformer. The transformer uses magnetic flux, so the core is built using magnetic material. The secondary coil is insanely thick. I guess the stronger currents are passed through the 12-volt coil, so a coil as thick as this one is necessary. Once we detach this terminal as well, we can see more semiconductors underneath. This is for switching the primary current transformer, and this is a rectifying diode for the secondary. Larger current passes through the right, so we have diodes arranged in a parallel circuit. This is all for today. We managed to take apart a Prius's inverter. To be honest, there were a lot more circuits and components than I had originally expected. Not only were there circuits and terminals, there were also IGBT models dealing with large current, inductors on the back, and a cooling mechanism for the semiconductors. It was interesting taking apart the converter as there were many unexpected components. These parts as well. The ways these circuits are arranged and laid out is fascinating. It must have been such a struggle to plan an inverter with so many components. If you enjoyed the video, please be sure to like and subscribe. And thank you for watching all the way to the end.